getting started. So welcome Andrew Osbach up to, to open the session and then we'll dive right in. So welcome everyone. Uh, and we've got folks online as well. Yes. Um, so uh, I'm stepping in for Eric Kastlander um, for the Global Information Management uh, Working Group. Uh, and first thing, Eric is saving us all from the age of COVID. So he has a consent and apology, but, but he's home sick. Um, and this will be an interesting session with you know the data responsibility working group. Um, there's an, a pretty impressive agenda. It's a bunch of great resources here. So we're looking forward to uh, to uh, a productive a productive session. And we'll pass right back over. So that's a big welcome from my end and the IM working group. Thank and you so much, Andrew. Thank you very much. And yeah, we've got the agenda on the screen. We can go through this in detail a bit later. We'll actually spare our colleagues online from the details, but essentially we have the next hour for a panel discussion, interactive and hybrid. Then we'll go into looking more specifically together as the GIMWG and the DRWG at challenges to data sharing and how we can address them together. We will observe the official coffee break at 3.30, I believe it is. And then we'll come back together for the more hands-on piece of work for the rest of the afternoon. So that's what you have in front of you. And with that, we'll dive right in. So hello, everybody in the room and online. I'm Stuart Campo, and I'm the team lead for data responsibility at the OCHA Center for Humanitarian Data. I'm joined here by three colleagues who have, of course, individual responsibilities and advisory capacities on this issue, but also are the co-chairs of the data responsibility working group. Katrin Sara from the DRC, Rachel Cloutier from UNHCR and Rob Trigwell from IOM. Together, our four entities co-chair this relatively new working group, which really complements the work that the GIMWG does to improve the use and impact of data in the sector and make sure that we're doing this in a safe, ethical, and effective way. Next slide. Just to give you a quick sense of our membership, we've grown to around 35 organizations since launching this group about two years ago. And you see that we have a good cross section of both data actors, operational agencies, and other parts of the humanitarian system that together help us make sure that we're informing everything we do with data and analysis. We would like to take a quick sort of call to people online or in the room if your organization is not on that slide to reach out to us and join the DRWG. It's an open group with an operational focus, and we meet quarterly and have a number of other sort of subwork streams, which we call task teams, looking at different issues of common concern. Much of our work is built around the IASC operational guidance on data responsibility. This is the first ever framework of its kind, which was developed and endorsed in its first iteration in February of 2021. We've just completed the rather arduous process of revising this document through global and field level consultations, a thorough desk review of new guidance, and also alignment with how we've actually implemented this in our own work and as a system over the past two years. The document from this month, which was just endorsed by the OPAG, should be online perhaps even by the end of this session, but certainly in the next couple of days. And we're really excited to basically use this opportunity of the event to share lessons learned in implementation over the past few years, as well as look ahead to how we can put this framework into practice. Just to give you a very quick sense of what we've tried to do here, there's the conceptual clarity that the document tries to offer between the humanitarian principles, data responsibility, and the more specific and arguably better understood concepts of data protection and data security, which we've really worked to align both in terms of internal institutional terminology, but also what this means in practice. So we hope that the operational guidance offers clarity on this and serves as a common reference for what people think about when they think about data responsibility, which again for us is the safe, ethical, and effective management of data. What the operational guidance offers is a set of principles and actions, and I'll quickly focus on the actions here, which you see on the screen, because we'll come back to that later in the day. These are really designed for implementation at three levels, the system-wide level in a given operation, which would be structures such as the IMWG, appropriate for this conversation, as well as the ICCG and HCT, then the cluster or sector structures, and finally, organizational structures. The actions are, we hope, <coughs> quite practical and seemingly clear to implement. We're looking at things like data impact assessments before you start an activity, information sharing protocols to inform how data is assessed in its sensitivity and how it's shared responsibly. 
designing for data responsibility, which is really how you do everything with data in a given activity with these different principles and considerations in mind. And appropriate again for HMPW, coordination and collaboration, really elevating the importance of this issue to senior leadership in a given operation, but also at the global level within our respective institutions. So we'll dig into these actions a bit during this discussion and then farther in the, the more interactive piece of the workshop later in the afternoon. I think that's me done talking. Yes, so let's dive right into the discussion. One of the things that we've learned over the past two years is that the organization level implementation of this framework has faced some blockers. We know that this is a complex topic that cuts across functions and that many institutions don't have their own frameworks for data responsibility in place. So to get us started, Katrine, could you share a bit of DRC's experience and some of the blockers to adoption of data responsibility, either in practice or also from the perspective of this framework? Yeah, thank you, Stuart. Let me start by saying that uh, data responsibility is indeed manageable, and that's what all these efforts, including also the specific operational guidance, is all about. To make it manageable, to make sure that we optimize and, and make the most of the data that we manage. But we do experience some challenges, and, and those are also what we seek to address as we move forward. So let me share three from an organizational level. First, what we've seen in recent years, a very important focus on personal data. And as an operational NGO, DSC, uh, based in the EU, we have had a lot of focus and continue to do so on, on personal data protection and GDPR specifically. And that systematized approach to how we manage personal data and the capacity that we need in place. That has maybe to some extent come at, I wouldn't say the expense, but given less focus to non-personal data. Uh, and non-personal data is also, can also carry with it sensitivities. And that is again back to being responsible in terms of how we work with data, that we also need to focus on non-personal data and how we address these sensitivities, these risks. So that's one part of it. And the other part of, of having that very important focus on personal data protection and personal data has also been that focus uh, on risks and how to mitigate and how to address risks and identify them in the first place. But again, the whole mindset and importance of both identifying benefits, but also risks. So moving forward, really seeking to balance, find that good important balance between making sure we do indeed identify the benefits, soliciting those, and see how we can optimize the use uh, and the benefits of the data that we manage. At the same time, of course, importantly, that we manage and mitigate the risks. So that was one challenge around that focus on personal data, but needing also to focus on non-personal data and having a focus on both the benefits and the risks. The next one is related because that's all about our ability and again capacity to indeed identify this was what we call the data sensitivities. So again, as I said, you know, both for personal data and there we have quite strong tools and approaches, even by law templates in place. So again, moving forward, we need an effort to, to also build the capacity and the approaches, joint shared approaches of how to identify data sensitivities of non-personal data so that we make sure that we make much more use of it, that we get around to share it even with sensitivities because until the time we really understand the sensitivities, it will be difficult to make more use of the data and share it with other actors and, and partners. And that leads me to the last uh, challenge or barrier that we continue to, to, to address and, and try to move forward on, and that's data sharing. And uh, this afternoon, after this, uh, plen uh, this panel discussion, we'll indeed focus on data sharing. That remains the biggest challenge, I think, for us, both internally in the organization, but much more and even more so between organizations. So again, I mean, moving forward, and here we have the operational guidance with these three dimensions of shared principles, of the actions that we also talk more about and the very specific templates also, including templates for facilitating information and data sharing. So in terms of uh, challenges, here are three, but also ideas of how we 
can address them. And with the guidance in hand, I mean, we see the great benefit of having come together and, and continue to pursue these collective efforts. Thanks so much, Katrin. And we often spend a lot of time talking about blockers and challenges and risks, and we'll try to actually lean into the enablers and the progress that we've made, because it is no small feat to have this guidance in place, no small feat to see how much it's been adopted into different institutional cluster and system-wide processes. And this is really about seeing how we can accelerate that adoption now. So thank you for giving us a sense of those blockers. We'll now look more on the sort of enabler track and Rochelle, yep. perhaps both at the institutional level, but any other broader observations from UNHCR's side, what are some of those key enablers to getting this work done right? So the first one is that we've taken a mainstreaming approach, which is to um, just like protection. So we can mainstream data responsibility into our policies and other types of guidance. As an organization, we may not be ready to have a data responsibility policy, but there are many ways to integrate data responsibility into other guidance work. Uh, so right now, for example, UNHCR has about half a dozen policies that refer to data responsibility principles. The other mainstreaming part is to integrate it into our trainings. So ideally, we would have a dedicated module on data responsibility. That is maybe a heavier lift than we're able to do, but we can still mainstream data responsibility principles and examples uh, into our other trainings. For example, a training on needs assessments. We can provide examples of how the principles come into practice in the considerations of what we do, how we do it, with whom and when. Uh, we can also link the needs assessment training back to data responsibility actions like uh, data ecosystem mappings and how that links up to needs assessment registries, for example. This mainstreaming approach may seem a bit uh, covert, uh, but it can go a long way, I think, in socializing data responsibility principles and practices and thereby supporting implementation not only with the data people, but across other functions. And, and that's really a, a key challenge. The second enabler is crisis, which provides an opportunity to do things differently. And we saw in Ukraine that there was this tremendous mobilization around the humanitarian response and the data and information classification sensitivity data and information sensitivity classification uh, that OCHA did for, um, for Ukraine was just such a milestone in terms of bringing to light the actions for data responsibility into a high profile um, emergency that really had the attention of, of the world and dare I say also really important donors. Um, so that classification was useful not only for the response in Ukraine, but then also to inspire in the context of the refugee response, um, more awareness with our colleagues about data responsibility, especially that sensitivity aspect, which is so key. So if we bring in data responsibility at the outset of an emergency, I think it can serve as a kind of springboard um, or catalyst to expand to other uh, data responsibility actions. The third enabler uh, is people and more specifically senior managers. Um, being in the field or working with our field colleagues, every time we talk about protection information management or principled approaches to data, everybody always says, this is great, but I can't do it without my senior managers. We, the senior managers need to understand what this is about, set the vision, set the program, and they also control the purse in terms of resources. So communication, capacity development, and advocacy with senior managers is really key uh, to make this happen so that they can be the champions and, and lead by example. And overall, this is linked maybe to the most general or macro level enabler, which is data culture. And it's a bit of a, a circular relationship, but um, a lot of data responsibility requires a minimum level of comfort with data and data related issues. And I think not all our colleagues are as comfortable as we would hope them to be. And so there's still this view that data responsibility is a bit that thing that the data people who sit in the corner over there take care of. And um, I think our shared hope in this work is, is really for data responsibility to be part of the normal way that we do things, and that an understanding of the principles and the actions are really shared across all functions and, and colleagues. 
that last piece is something I think that particularly resonates in the work that we've supported in different operations and is important for this group because often I am as seen as that thing that those people over there are doing. And similarly, we've seen that actually when we introduce data responsibility through the IM lens exclusively, it's hard to get traction, as you're saying, in an office. Humanitarian affairs officers, program specialists, protection advisors are as critical to this work as people who work more hands-on with data and information every day, but it's hard to shift that culture. So it's really helpful to hear some of the ways that you're doing that at HCR, and I think it can inform how other orgs are thinking about that as well. Perhaps a nice segue to you, Rob, in terms of the way that IOM is looking at this. What are some ways that organizations can really invest in building some of that capacity, but also activating adoption in work with data. Yeah. <clears throat> Thanks, Stuart, and good afternoon, colleagues. I mean, so building on the experience of IOM since um, since 2021, but also before then, kind of building on the work of the signal code that kind of set a bit of this, this tone, um, we kind of taken like a twofold approach. I mean, data's cross-cutting, and um, it's worth me caveating that I work for the displacement tracking matrix team. That is a data collection team, so kind of have quite a predominant kind of data focus, but our twofold approach is integrating kind of data responsibility into programs. So IOM is an operational human agency. We have direct program implementation, whether it's cash, shelter, wash, care management, and so on. So, and then there's the second bit, which kind of Rochelle kind of reached to is also the institutional buy-in. So, through the integrating a program, you know, starting with DTM is that that's much more tangible, it's a bit more obvious of where data responsibility fits. Kind of that goes in the program design. It goes in, we've just in the last 18 months, we've developed kind of 15 standards that kind of fit within a standard data collection DTM lifecycle and fit in kind of data responsibility into the different blocks of that. Yeah, as I say, whether it's kind of the project management design whether it's sharing and kind of giving the tools of how to better enable access um, to, to that data, also around kind of coordination. If you know, if you know that data is collected for the for the purpose of the wider interagency community, how that looks, how that shares, how that feels important, you know, like so if you know that this data is public, how you may aggregate that in the analysis, it's kind of all feeds into that. It's better doing that than kind of not sharing anything at all. So that kind of output of the data needs to kind of feed into the beginning to enable the coordination, not to block it. So it's like, it's how can these tools and functions kind of enable sharing and interoperability and kind of better interagency analysis and so on. Um, and we've kind of this whole big push on intersectoral analysis. I only see that kind of getting larger in this kind of cross color, this cross cluster sharing. I mean, and then there's kind of integration into um, kind of just more kind of tangible programs. I mean, Data responsibility, you could assume that it's going to be the data people speaking to, but which is, but every program team has data in integrating the, into, into the programs. There's beneficiary lists, there's targeting criteria, there's populate, you know, numbers and locations of, of camps with vulnerable populations in. So kind of really building the awareness and kind of the, the, if you were handling data, irrespective of if you're an IMO or a DTM colleague, that you need to kind of be integrating these kind of principles and actions into your programs because it's because data is a key part of a shelter program. So you need to have these. And that's and you know this so this is for awareness raising, this is through kind of flagging the data responsibility isn't a IMWG or IMO topic, but it's a project it's a project manager kind of uh, role as well or action. Um, I mean, a, a, a tangible example of that is uh, we have an AAP kind of work stream and our AAP colleagues have kind of adopted data responsibility as one way that they can kind of push the accountability. When accountability and people sent it, people sent an inclusiveness are two of the principles of um, our guidance, but I've kind of leaned very much into the AAP community. And um, I mean, a colleague in the room kind of Post like community is community communicating DR to the AP network that probably wouldn't necessarily sit in like the IMWG room. So it's kind of pushing that to push in the same tone, but to different audiences by just reflecting that data is just a part of your life a bit, like how monitoring and evaluation is. And then going back, going back to the second kind of fold is is institutional buy-in. And so like you one of your flat the diagram earlier was like data protection and data security are two very well known 
very hashed out as you know in in iom we have a legal team that work on data protection uh data security we sit of our kind of our ict team and speaking from experience with like a data collection working for a data collection team we speak about data responsibility about kind of like purpose like the information we collect is for response so it needs to be purposefulness it needs to be kind of timeless it's not a shopping list of everything you might want and nice to have information the issue is is that we iom doesn't have a a guidance on what is data responsibility so in the absence of that we've um we've got the department of operations and emergencies to send out a to almost like institutionalize the ISCC document as the potentially interim or potentially kind of permanent kind of like reference point on the data responsibility and that gives us the dtm colleagues a lot of power because it means that unless you can articulate why you might be reaching out to ask this particular information that isn't not nice to have then we can be like well this doesn't this is against the principles so yeah so um that's kind of like the two routes it's like the soft approach integrating into existing programs that i'm sure many of the kind of ngos can relate to who have kind of have that kind of direct service and then there's like okay how do we like institutionalize and make like reference points so and because I, I i would be surprised if many organizations outside of OCHA have like a data responsibility document, but most would have a data security and data protection one. But as the diagram kind of presented, it's a much more like all encompassing term and it's kind of a new term and people don't quite understand it yet. Um, so having this as a reference point has been very, very useful for us. And I hope, I mean, for many organizations that resonates because the goal is not everyone to create a role and function called data responsibility or everyone needs their own policy or framework for this area of work. It's something that, I mean, based on all three of your interventions is embedded in various parts of our work with data, embedded in how we think about a policy and guidance framework for our institutions and critically on the culture and capacity piece, how everyone sees themselves in the different actions that we're actually calling for at the practical operational level. And that's where it can still feel a bit heady and conceptual. Also on a Thursday afternoon at HMPW, I've been in many conversations. So let's ground a little bit in the next round and sort of what this looks like in practice. So coming back to you, Katrine, practically speaking, how is DRC using the operational guidance to actually do more safe, more ethical, more effective data management? Thank you, Anu. I, and I would actually build uh, from Rob's uh, comment just before because there are different levels by which we've seen the great use and helpfulness of, of uh, data responsibility as a concept. And it is a relatively new concept that has come with this the guidance. But what it's meant for us internally has been incredibly helpful because we had exactly the same colleagues working on data security, data protection, and then the colleagues working on, on broader. I mean, I come from the protection sector. So oftentimes in the past, I mean, colleagues have been looking to us and me in terms of uh, because we know within protection, there are highly sensitive data because this is data about protection risks. This is data about rights violations, but we haven't come together. And this is what we can do now, because now we have the framework. Now we have the language with data responsibility and back to that exactly that diagram. Now it's bringing everything together, both in terms of people, in terms of thinking. I mean, very concretely in terms of our tools and, and approaches and policies that we can have this under the, the overall umbrella of data responsibility. What is also super helpful for us, as I said, coming from the protection sector, colleagues have been looking to us and that's very good because we have been working with protection information management and doing so in exactly a responsible and safe and ethical, effective manner. But now we have a guidance that cuts across sectors, and that's very important because that, yeah, enable us to move away from this. You know, this is the data people's responsibility, or this is the protection sector people's responsibility. No, it's the responsibility of all of us. And now we can we can sort of join the disciplines across uh, different sectors. But also, again, as I mentioned earlier, this whole benefit of, of looking at and making sure we not only focus on personal data, but also the non-personal data. So that's at the conceptual level, but but not it's not a small thing that we now have a joint language, a common language and a reference point, so to speak. Then in terms of the principles, 
when you look at them, there are 12 in the operational guidance. These are not new. These are known to all of us, but now we have them in one place zoomed in on data responsibility, zoomed in on moving forward for the sake of not of being well, also of being da data responsible, of course, but but it's for the sake of having quality humanitarian outcomes. That's what we want to achieve. So being data responsibility uh, responsible is about the modality of how we work, but we have the goal in place. So I'm not going to mention all the principles. They are equally important, but I just want to draw out three that we concretely use. I mean, very, very frequently in DSC in terms of advancing the data responsible management of of, uh, of the of the data we work on. The defined purpose that you were also mentioning, Rob, is uh, the defined purpose, necessity, and proportion. The fact and the commitment to make sure that we zoom in and that we are not only being, you know, managing in a safe manner, but also efficient manner that we zoom in, define the purpose for which we need the data and not for all sorts of other things and that it's meant to take action. So that action orientedness of this principle is super important. The accountability, that is a broad commitment way beyond uh, data responsibility. But in this context, again, we are managing, we are working with affected people's data. It's not our data. So that is super important as a starting point. And again, it's about being responsible about working with other people's data and doing that in a, in a, in a safe and ethical and eth efficient manner. And then it also comes with the commitment to have the competencies in place and, and the capacities required to do this work. Um, so again, not embarking on this work if you don't have the capacities in place. And lastly, there is the coordination and collaboration principles. So again, I mean, these are collective efforts and we need to have these different groups of colleagues or disciplines, if you like, around the table, both internally in our organizations, the program people, the sectoral people, the data people, the, the IT people, and so forth. And likewise, of course, as we work together. So, so uh, the principles, I mean, have been very uh, sort of concrete for us because that has enabled us to put the spotlight on these uh, commitments and what it actually looks like in practice to operationalize them. And that's, I'll finish after that. That is the second element, the actions that then follows from the, that Stuart also brought up on the screen earlier. Again, the actions we very much see as the way of how we operationalize the principles. What does it mean? What actions do you need to take? The actions for me is also sort of depicting the process that we need to go through. So again, having that structured approach to how we work with data, starting with diagnostic, we call it the data responsibility diagnostic, but, but thinking about what do we already have in place in terms of being responsible, in terms of safeguards, in terms of being ethical, in terms of being efficient, where are the gaps? So it's all about that structured approach to doing this work. And that's so much easier now that we have the actions telling us what to do. Next is the data, what we call the data management registry. And that's really this effort that we all need to do, but and we need to get better at that is to find out what data do we already have. I mean, that we see it again and again that we run out to collect more data, not having taken the effort both internally, but also very much in terms of you know externally working with others, what are other partners actors collecting, what is already in place. What, where are the gaps and what do we need to do? And I could go on, but, but the, the actions is really super helpful in terms of depicting that structured approach that we can come together because we now have a shared sort of understanding of what needs to happen at, at the various stages. Great, Katrin, thanks for much. There's a lot to unpack there, but I think just one sort of piece to highlight, especially given this audience, is that a lot of this is not new practice. It might be evolved terminology, but the data management registry, for example, is essentially an assessment registry with additional data management activities reflected in it, which is bread and butter in the IM world. So we're not introducing a totally new set of things to do. We're offering a common language. We're perhaps suggesting different approaches to getting to a similar result, offering templates to enable that. But it's not to suggest that this is a whole cloth, a new area of work for the sector, not by a long shot. I think the concepts, as all the panelists have mentioned, pre-exist 
you know, in, in most cases institutionally. And a lot of this is about catalyzing additional action, creating more entry points for getting the same work done to better understand and respond to the needs of people in crisis. For UNHCR as a protection agency, of course, a lot of this work has pre predated the work of the operational guidance, but could you give us a sense, Rochelle, of one area that's really a focus for HCR and how the operational guidance might help sort of expand or accelerate that work in practice? Um, I think I, we share the sentiment that the, the OG has really been a, a milestone. And although we haven't taken the step that you described, Rob, um, I think it nonetheless uh, remains the go to reference uh, because of the consultative way in which it was um, developed. And it has the authority of that YASC uh, endorsement. And indeed, in the absence of anything else, it does serve as that. Uh, nice consolidated guidance to reflect the the thinking in the community and and I think it's a great sign that that thinking has matured to the point where we can do something like operational guidance on data responsibility and humanitarian action thinking to where the conversations were seven eight nine years ago um, with with Pim but also the simple fact as you say as humanitarian actors this should be a no brainer in terms of our willingness to commit and to do this. Um, that said, so one way that um, the YASC uh, operational guidance has, has really come into UNHCR is an area of focus for our data work has been on data protection and privacy. Uh, you may have seen that late last year, we released a new general policy on personal data protection and privacy which has the somewhat awkward acronym of GDPP, <laughs> not to be confused with GDPR. <laughs> this is the GDPP for UNHCR. And it sets a unified framework for um, all the personal data that's processed by UNHCR. So our 2015 policy was specific to the processing of personal data of persons of concern, now known as the persons we serve. Um, and this general policy covers the processing of personal data of all of the data subjects um, whose data will be processed by UNHCR, i.e. persons of uh, persons we serve, staff, visitors, donors, partners, um, everyone. And it was a kind of interesting uh, serendipitous moment because the work to develop the GDP, GDPP coincided with the revision of the 21 YASC operational guidance. And so that work in the DRWG context uh, complemented our internal policymaking discussions um, because it helped us make the necessary distinctions and links between data protection and data responsibility. And I think both Rob and, and Katrine have, have highlighted, highlighted um, just how important and valuable that conceptual clarity is. So we had many discussions about how this fits together. And these were discussions that were internal to UNHCR between the DRWG co-chairs and here, uh, Stuart's famous patience, I think <laughs> really came, uh, came out. Um, and of course, with the DRWG uh, members overall and across that diverse set of members that you introduced at the beginning. Um, and the synergy was on two fronts, definitions and principles. So on definitions, um, confusion in terms is a big barrier. And that Venn diagram, which we saw on the screen, which Katrine um, has now shown, those distinctions between data responsibility, data protection, and data security um, is really important. And to show as well that it's a Venn diagram, you know, data security is a principle of data protection and data responsibility. Um, Data protection is a principle of data responsibility. And of course, all of that in the broader context of our humanitarian principles, which we should not lose sight of, because it also points us to your point, Katrine, about this being about impact for affected communities. The second uh, synergy was on the principles. So there was a lot of discussions about how to formulate the principles in a way that made the necessary distinctions between the application of data responsibility for personal data and non-personal data. I think that was one of the main discussion points over the past couple of years at least, and you'll see in the definition of data responsibility that 
it is a very carefully crafted definition to kind of show that data responsibility is applicable to both types of data with the necessary distinctions and safeguards and applicable legal frameworks, et cetera. And, and that's very useful as well. So, and that manifested in the principles where we have a specific principle on personal data protection and the chapeau to the section of principles. And this is where Yos's patients, I think is now famous as well uh, as, as having led the work on the principles. Um, that the chapeau to the section of principles really highlights the relationship between data responsibility principles and data protection principles, which may often seem similar in the label, but we're talking about different things and that's explained. So, coming back to how the OG has has uh, influenced our, our work these past years on, on data protection, um, there's at least four great things that have happened. Um, the first one is that it raised data protection, the profile of data protection and data responsibility in UHCR. Um, it enabled us internally to have a conversation about data protection that was framed within the overarching chapeau of data responsibility as that big bucket of ethical approaches to data management. It also drew attention to the gaps that we might have in standards and guidance for non-personal data. We, the, the field of personal data is highly, usually highly regulated. There's lots of policies, applicable laws, but then there's this like black box of non-personal data which needs to be unpacked, especially when we talk about sensitive non-personal data. And yesterday at the DRWG members meeting, we're talking about sensitive non-personal data like GIS coordinates of an alleged mass grave. It's not a free-for-all just because it's not personal data and we need to figure that out. And then the other kind of great thing that came out is um, I think it allowed us as UNHR to become more aware of the practices of other organizations in data protection and data responsibility um, through the discussions and consultations that were happening. So we have a very strict sense of when a data sharing agreement is required, when a data protection impact assessment is required, and this is highly regulated, but it's not the same thing for all organizations. So I think sharing those practices in the context of the work on the guidance um, improved our understanding of the practices of others and hopefully will enable better collaboration in the future. Great. Yeah. And I think we see that already in practice, that mm -hmm. that collaboration globally and also operationally in a number of contexts is really enabled by people feeling commonly sort of rallied around mm -hmm. this framework. It gives them a neutral basis for discussion beyond their institutional guidelines and policies. And it also can help, I think, start a conversation. We often are connecting our country counterparts to your yeah. country counterparts, and it's sort of built that kind of global to local or global to operational connection that's critical to get this work done. Rob, just to come back to you for another practical example in terms of how this work manifests in your own work with data as IOM, what's you know one specific action that jumps out to you, or maybe a few, if you have a few in mind, that you'd like to share? Yeah, thanks, Joe. I mean, the most obvious one coming specifically coming from the fact I'm from a data collection kind of team is designing for data responsibility. And also like we collect information on it. Uh, mobility, you know, DTM is well known for collecting information on kind of information on locations and geospatial information about kind of internally displaced, but we also collect information on kind of wider human mobility people move in. And, and I think we have to also consider the misuse of data as well when we're designing it. I think that's, I think that's incredibly important. Um, I mean, you know, 13, you know, I know it's 13, 15 years ago, uh, you know, the current state, the state of the kind of humanitarian ecosystem is very different to now, you know, now every agency has the capacity to collect large swaths of information to a much higher standard. There's interoperability through like, you know, Hexel, it's way more accessible uh, through the, the amazing work of HDX, you know, all massive innovations and progressions in the sector. I started my career in Libya uh, back in 2011. And, you know, if you wanted kind of displacement data, you would have to be in the shelter cluster median 
promising the shadow cluster coordinator that you didn't have a virus on your USB pen. And now DTM data got downloaded 1.3 million times from HDX like last year, which is incredible. But also, it also means that data's ended up in more weird and wonderful places that I don't think we may, may have necessarily anticipated. And speaking as a Brit rather than a IOM, a lot of movement information, particularly like towards Europe, movement data, migration data is often anti-migrant data. And, you know, so if we're collecting information on flows, we have to think right before we've even collected one piece of information, how we're going to share that publicly and how we may not share that publicly. So like, if you want the real actionable information, we have to be fine with no, that never being public because the Daily Mail would love that. And, when, you know, that would go against that matter. So I think you do have to think about the misuse as well. And, that, and then, but going back to the principles, you know, like it's pretty straightforward with DTM. Like we have to collect actionable information to inform humanitarian action decision making. So the principles are really kind of defined for purpose, necessity, as in what's the purpose of it and do you need it? Uh, coordination and collaboration. We collect information for the interagency community to do better work. And what well, we play a part of that, I should say. Uh, and yeah, and the quality, so methodology. So I would say that kind of like that mindset, you know, continuously improving how we kind of think about the back end of the process is important and improving the kind of data management cycle all throughout from design, through collection, through uh, cleaning, storage, centralization, um, sharing analysis and so on. I'm really kind of just improving that um, throughout the process. Um, yeah. and. Sharing's become a big one for us, and going back to the work on um, with the Ukraine example, like we've always kind of mapped locations of where people were in need of uh, of humanitarian aid. You know, there's an event. How many people have been displaced? Where are they? What are their basic needs? What are their vulnerabilities? But you know, and we try and provide. It's a bit of a balancing act about providing actionable information to inform humanitarian action versus exposing vulnerabilities and kind of protection concerns. So how we then kind of like share that, well, okay, we have to think, okay, is it okay to share at this kind of level in this context or another? So like we used the sensitivity classification guide from Ukraine. That was it. it truly enabling for us because it it was like, okay, here's like a aggregated picture of where people are, but not as a group or the community, but a safe level to kind of share publicly. But then if you want more detail, more granular information to directly inform your operations, then you have to specifically request that through HDX. And so, and so we kind of put that into our design of our programming. So just basically like, you know, where the entire community kind of wants information out there, but you kind of have to know at what level that's going to be kind of open and also at one level that's going to be accessible. And that's two very different things. Um, or to so, yeah, I would say, I mean, that's, the, that's the easy 1 for us is kind of like at each stage of the data management cycle. Okay. How, you know, think bigger picture, like, actually, is this data kind of serving our mandate? Is it serving the better purpose of the community? And if it's not, you know, being fine with the fact that, you know, maybe this piece of data won't see the public, but it might have impacts in, in kind of other ways. Yeah, I mean, that resonates certainly with what we see in the sector writ large in terms of moving beyond that posture of fully open to really thinking about how to share and protect. And I like the idea of accessible rather than open for much of the data that's available. Of course, fully open access is coming from the center very much what we want to see. But we also want to get people thinking about the weird and wonderful places where more sensitive data might end up and how to how to make sure that we then direct that data to the people that can and should have access to it safely. Sorry to count it back, but I think with the, you know, the push for forecasting, like one thing I've seen particularly with DTM in the last two years is at externals outside of this room, outside this building, outside this city, looking at our data um, of like, how can we look at the impacts on climate on mobility, but like into forecasting. And I don't think we've, it, like, so particularly where's the data and where the wonderful places, I think particularly what in integrated into models is something that we haven't quite properly thought about as extensively. It's fine. You know, we think more about how does it 
feed into the HPC processes, but I think we're all being pushed to like look more, you know, foresight, future, whatever the, the term is these days. But, you know, and that I think opens up a interesting area of like extra issues or extra considerations when you work in the data space that we do. Absolutely. It's a good segue to the Q and A, because otherwise we'll just keep chatting <laughs> and maybe to kind of invite questions with a provocation, much of the challenge we've had as a group is sort of what is in and out of scope in the data responsibility discussion. So is a discussion about how advanced analytical methods and tools are used in the sector under the umbrella of data responsibility fully, partially, not at all. How do we think about the use of this framework to inform safe, ethical, and effective data management across the use of digital tools and data in the system without sort of trying to make this everything and nothing? And how do we make sure to the points that each of you had made that the goal is better assistance to people in crisis? It's not to implement these actions for the sake of it. So how do we make sure that that outcome driven mindset stays how we look at this issue and make sure that we're really delivering the best results that we can? I can't really see the chat, but I'm sure if there are questions, funny, you'll let me know. So opening up to the floor. Yes, go ahead. Um, I I really appreciate the first play of the event. I always like saying data because the and that is not of the data is very hard. But it's always really a good to hear the question people on the field on whoever on your teams like who is the data? Many people will like many data people like and people will say like, oh for God, but it does. So when it's on, it's uh, I really appreciate that all the point the three key principles that you were saying. It's like I'm really the participation. It's a good question. How is data responsibility understood from the perspective of uh, the affected population? Do they understand what they are trying to see the data? And this leads into two other questions that are can cannot be answered. Like how are we involving the people that are seeking to assist the beneficiaries of uh, EDC sort of program that this representation uses in the process of uh, the uh, design, the collection, the process of data storage? And more so than that, that uh, restitution or giving back the data to community is probably very important for this project, which is uh, really interesting. How are they? How are we going to give back the data that we end sales? And in the end, how are we as time for the other data people using it for me, for the effective programming and for the community organization folder? How are we able to get out of the corner and pick the like where of people in the corner? How are we acting in communication with the program projects um, about the things that we collect? Information that we have, the value of information that we have to create an effective change in the way that our communities are traditionally implemented or traditionally designed. That is a great set of questions. I'm going to ask for other questions to give the panelists a little bit of time to reflect. Any other questions? Yes. Um, uh, yes, Alex Lippert from Red UK. Um, I was wondering about if um, the consequences of mishandling data being considered at all. And forgive me for not being familiar with the, the, the document. The GDPR, the, the, the basis is people will be fined. Right. Um, and so they look at their time to be doing all this in, inappropriate things. Happy um, if any. Good question. Any others? Yes, Shannon. Well, all the matter, like, something that our, our colleague was saying. As a very consideration about the power dynamics in terms of collecting data, and whether it is ever truly consensual. Mm -hmm. If I'm WFP, for example, and I arrive in the field and I say, you're not getting your food unless you give me all of your personal information so I can give you a beneficiary card. It's either I give my data to get food or I don't get anything. And then, as you were saying, how do you give that data back? They don't know who they're giving their data to. They don't really have a say in terms of how we operate. And the reporting that we have to do vis a vis what we're spending. Yeah, it's a slightly rhetorical question, but a really important additional kind of dimension of what was asked. So maybe we start there, um, looking both at the way through the discussion on the development of the principles and then subsequent revision. We spent a lot of time as a group talking about this the role of people affected by crisis in data management from end to end, how to reflect that, and also how to be realistic 
about, about what operationally would be feasible. What are some thoughts that come to mind in terms of either how we might do that, or if your organization is doing it already, how, how that can look in practice, and then linked, of course, to the complexities, let's say, around consent, um, what are some of the, the challenges that we still need to address as a system? I'll start with you. <laughs> Thank you. No, thanks for those great questions. No, indeed, on the, I mean, there is also one of the 12 principles is people centered and inclusive. And indeed, that is all about making sure affected people are part of this because it is their data and how throughout the process. And uh, it is, again, of course, balancing against the reality. And I mean, depending on the context and the level of crisis, emergency situation, there will be different opportunities and restrictions for this. But I think we are also seeing some promising uh, practices coming up both in terms of giving back, I mean, the feedback loop and all these talks we have about, you know, yeah, it could be anything. I mean, what we have tried is, you know, validation workshops and so on, on, on the findings from whatever data management uh, activity that you have, and then you come back to the community and in that way. So that's feedback. But I think also this, again, coming back to the process, which I think is so super important that we have a shared understanding of the process and that's including also how we, you know, sort of mainstream the participation of affected people and their inclusion throughout and not only in the data collection sort of part of the exercise, but from the very beginning, because again, coming back to data responsibility, there's so much, I mean, these are the people living their daily lives. Uh, they have, and they will know what are the risks also in terms of how we manage the data. So having them involved from the outset in terms of also thinking about, you know, what data can be shared in what format would it be? So having that whole dialogue together with the affected communities, not only when we collect the data, but from the outset and throughout. So to close that loop, but again, yes, there are really promising practices and I think efforts in this regard, but again, also sometimes it is really challenging because time is short and situation may not allow for us re-accessing maybe even an area so yeah that just very quickly that piece on sort of the nature of a crisis and what practices become accepted and and standard practice in say a no regrets and initial phase of a response has been particularly poignant in this space of data responsibility it's been hard to negotiate back in some context from a kind of approach of anyone who can get data and make it available should do that to a more measured approach. And so I think that's where trying to get from the outset, as you say, that involvement of affected people in determining what sensitivity levels could look like and also what's what they're comfortable sharing for what purpose is key. It is very difficult to do in practice. Rochelle or Rob, any thoughts or additional reflections on this question? Um. I think the AAP component is important because it's easy to to limit AAP to this notion of feedback complaints and response mechanisms. Um, and there are a number of data responsibility principles that point us to something very different. There's the accountability principle, the people centered and inclusive, the transparency, the human rights based approach. All of this points us towards people and. Um, Yes, we, we need to, to, to think about how to include uh, affected populations in all our data management activities, not just as a kind of uh, transactional, can you make sure the translation is okay, uh, right? The affected populations will have huge contributions and insights at the analysis moment. They will have huge insights to let us know which data collection tools are appropriate and feasible in the context. Um, so many doors are open in terms of how we do our work, plus the, the localization, the empowerment, the, all the, the good things that come with um, having a much more inclusive approach. On the consent and the power dynamics, um, it's important, and as Stuart was saying, it was um, really a, a common thread and a recurring theme in all the work on the guidance. Um, I think what's important uh, is that consent needs to be meaningful. And I think 
our colleagues at all levels were very decentralized. So HQ um, regional and bureaus and, and operations were getting there, um, I think, to a better space. And there's been a push recently through the work on the GDPP um, to, to look at information notices and for those to be clear, simple, uh, meaningful, and so that people who are sharing their information really understand what's going on and that um, we can stand behind the information that we're providing to people about what we're doing with their data. And I think the principles of um, data protection, uh, personal data protection, defined purpose, um, and others really also point us to the fact that we don't always need to collect personal data to do everything that we need to do in a given context. Of course, for needs assessments and targeting and case management, yes, but we can do a lot to understand a situation without collecting uh, personal data and therefore remove ourselves from that exposure and, and be in a more a data minimization uh, perspective um, than we might otherwise. Um, but yes, I think meaningfulness is um, Kind of keyword that comes to mind. Great. Thanks so much. In the interest of time, Rob, would you like to take a stab at the second question on the consequences of misuse and also how we've thought about that in the context of the guidance, but also some of the challenges to having an evidence base around that? The consequence on GDPR. Well, sort of the consequences of people not sort of following these practices. There's not an accountability from a systemic perspective. This is not a stick, right? It's more of an enticement and a carrot. But how are we thinking, or how might we think about organizations who don't follow what's uh, yeah what's laid out in the framework? I mean, yeah, I mean, it's a good question. Um, I think kind of like we have the guidance, but I think kind of standards on what we actually mean by this. I mean, um, kind of I'm I'm from the NGO world, and you know we in service delivery like simple things like we used to sphere standards as like, like a self governance tool, like we would self regulate and self-report our own activities against the standards because something a benchmark like that has been brought into by the community by the community they're very kind of common terms people know them so like if someone said to me like which dtm operation is the most data responsible i would give a strange answer because we don't have that benchmark i could probably say which one does the best analysis which has the best coverage I could speak a bit more in depth about kind of intricate DTM stuff, but like uh, having that core benchmark would be key. What that would look like is interesting. I'm not sure, but I've, that's kind of how like that's kind of how the the sector works. And to be to be a realistic, like there's a lot of bad programming out there, and NG and not just NGOs, and funding will happen recurrently. Like follow up, like we can speak about that, but it doesn't happen with bad programming that we see. And so I, so when incidences do happen, I think. Um, we learn a lot from this, right? Like we learn a lot from, from when an agency gets hacked. We learn a lot when there's a data breach. It's probably the one time where senior management pay crazy amounts of attention to internal cyber and policies is when like like ICRC got hacked last year. It was very public. I thought that was amazing for the sector that they were so public about it. Because in my opinion, if ICRC can get hacked, anyone can get hacked because they're the leaders on it. And the sat they were, they were so public about it, mm. I thought was commendable. And I think that is why they are seen as the leader. Because, so I wouldn't say it's going, I wouldn't say it's like cutting someone's funding if they get hacked. I mean, if you work in Ukraine, you're probably going to be targeted, let's be honest. But I think to report in incidences, because we learn from that, you don't learn from success, you learn from error just in life. Um, and then secondly, because we're in a project-based sector, people really like, it's not really conducive to that, to be frank. Um, so the other way to, in in parallel, is kind of minimum benchmarks. You know, like I haven't worked in WASH for ten years, but I could tell you that the, the standard is one to twenty. You know, from you know, like these are just hardwired into your brain, uh, and it would be great to kind of see that in the data responsibility space. That you know, like it could be simple things like you know every data set that you publish. Uh, has to have like a, con a complementary like piece of metadata so people can understand it better so people can't accidentally misinterpret it. We get this a lot with DTM. A black spot in DTM doesn't normally mean there's no IDPs. It normally means we can't access it, which probably means that is where the greatest need is. But unless we articulate that with the data set, you can 
accidentally misinform people. Um, so uh, yeah, I wouldn't say necessarily scolding someone for doing wrong. I'd say encourage when accidents do happen to become public and kind of almost commended for being so public about the issue because it happens to everyone. And then also kind of putting in minimum benchmarks. So like, so IOM, whoever can be like, yeah, like our team is being responsible. Or this is the areas that we are good. And this is the areas we should improve on. Yeah. And I think, sense. sorry, no, and I think that sphere partners is a potential route. We could go on that. Like, and I think that would be an excellent kind of suite and tools that my country teams could use extensively. Mm -hmm. It's a good place to end on also, as we segue into the next phase of the afternoon, because indeed the operational guidance is guidance. It is not a standard in the humanitarian standard sense of the term and understanding a bit more practically what these actions and principles look like in the context of different data management activities is going to be the focus for the rest of the afternoon. For the colleagues online, thank you so much for joining us. We will be sure to, uh, in one way or another, share a readout from the rest of the day. If you weren't able to join us here in person, Katrine, Rochelle, and Rob, thank you so much for your insight and sharing your experience here. And of course, you don't get to leave. Um, we'll be here for the rest of the afternoon. So people who have questions that you weren't able to ask, feel free to pull the panelists aside and discuss that over coffee. So we'll log out of that room and then we will get off the stage and I'll hand over to my colleague. Yo